Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, <laughs> hey, stop laughing. Um, Hey everybody, thank you all so much for putting this on. This, is, uh, this has been an incredibly innovative couple of weeks uh, that our community has really kind of navigated. Um, I recognize and understand just how, how strange these times are and, and how stressful they can be for some folks. And times like these are really important because it gives us the opportunity to still talk. Um, I'm grateful for my colleagues before me who have, I believe, done a wonderful job talking about um, the coronavirus crisis talking about our state response to it, um, and system of our economy, um, of, our, of our worker protections. It's shown, this time has shown people who perhaps maybe weren't thinking about it as much before. Maybe they were coming from a position uh, where these weren't things and ideas that were on their mind that were at the forefront. But when I ran for office and in and, and my time in office up until this crisis, you know, these inequities, uh, this systemic inequality, these have been things that, that, that compelled me to run in the first place and it's been what's informed and guided my work uh, my entire time that I've been in office and before. Uh, when I first ran, it was, it was a little, people thought it was a long shot, you know, to talk about Medicare for all and to talk about uh, the value of, of clean air and clean water, particularly as it pertains to environmental racism. Uh, what we're seeing right now um, are all of these arguments and the importance of them laid out right now. Um, I'm proud that in my time in, in the State House, I have really uh, helped, I believe, to talk about and, and, and kind of uplift a new narrative about some of these what we call progressive issues, but what we really know are just basic human rights. Uh, we know that right now, more than ever, that it's inhumane for people who have not committed or been convicted of a crime to lay in a jail uh, on, on cash bail. Uh, especially right now while we have a crisis. Uh, we know what happens when we have a society where every person does not have health care, does not have Medicare, uh, where folks who are sick, when the working class uh, can't afford to take off, uh, they can't afford to stay home from work when they're sick, and they have no one to watch their children um, in, a, in a case of emergency. Uh, what we're seeing right now is, is absolutely extraordinary, but it's not abnormal. It's abnormal and it's extraordinary in the sense that it's impacting everyone, uh, but it's not extraordinary in the sense that these very issues are day-to-day -day issues for the most marginalized, for people in those most vulnerable communities. It's why those communities are the ones that are last to react, because for them, this is the daily occurrence wondering how they're going to pay their bills when our minimum wage hasn't been raised since 2007, wondering how they're going to afford housing, you know, as gentrification sets in, as the housing market um, it skyrockets, how we're going to uh, pay for our education. These are everyday issues for people, and it's why I ran for office. Um, in my short time, my 100 days, I've done probably about 15 events, whether it be forums and um, senior brunches and senior events and health events for my district. I've really tried to bring a new representation to this district. I've been able to bring people into the fold uh, for our police accountability package. We brought around 450 people to the, uh, to the Capitol. A lot of young people from the high schools in our area who never interacted with their government in that way, who learned how to lobby on behalf of themselves, uh, who learned how important it is to use their voices. Um, in the legislation, I've worked with Dignity for Incarcerated Women. Uh, we've gone to three of the prisons. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the women that folks have not been to to have a forum with the with the population there to testify I mean we've been able to take their testimony and put it into legislation that will really really help this population um, I've also been able to help convene uh, a Green New Deal uh, roundtable across the state um, and other things around those very progressive issues that we care about that we've been working on um, we are moving slowly of course we have a, a, a majority of Republicans still but the work we're doing now is foundational it'll set us up uh, for when we do finally win back the house, when we are finally ready to move. Uh, but as we talk about these narratives and create these narratives, um, these are, the, these are the, the policies that will impact every person in and out of a crisis. Uh, so I, I value your support last time. I was so very grateful for it. I'm, I'm asking for it again. I'm happy to, to answer any questions about uh, what I've done in my one year <laughs> in office, what I plan to do if I'm elected again. Um, and I'm happy to hear from all of you. Thank you. Okay, anybody who has a question for Representative Lee, uh, uh, click to raise your hand. We'll give it a couple of uh, couple of seconds. So here's John Titus has a question. Hi, um, I have a question. I know that you have endorsed um, Bernie Sanders for president, but if Joe Biden would win the nomination, would you support um, Joe Biden, endorse him? Well, I endorse him. He won't need my endorsement if he won. 
if he wins the nomination. Okay. Listen, I've been a Democrat since I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I have voted in every presidential race. I intend to do so into the future. Uh, when we think about uh, the sacrifices, especially that black women have made, we always come through. 97% of us voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, and I bet that we'll, we'll be the same uh, irrespective of who the nominee is in November. My only wish is that we had heeded and shown some solidarity in the front end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martha Rack has her hand up next, I believe. Yes, uh, can you hear me? I can. All right, Summer, uh, I know I've heard your explanation, but perhaps others would like to hear about fracking and why you voted against uh, that proposed bill and uh, the other women, you know, the one yeah. that I'm talking hundred. about. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you so much for asking. It's a really contentious issue. Uh, and it's one that I think um, maybe we can, make, we can possibly relate to a little bit better now that we're actually in a global pandemic. Uh, but what uh, HB 1100 would have done, it, was a, it would have created an unprecedented subsidy, tax subsidy for the oil and gas industry. Um, and that's important because while we understand that we have workers who are in this industry who rely on work, we also recognize that building out the, that further building out the petrochemical hub uh, will have disastrous uh, effects for our environment and for those folks who uh, live either within proximity of it or downstream of it. Um, that's us. Uh, when we think about fracking and, and, the, and the impacts of it, we know from other places, Louisiana and other places across the country, that with fracking comes health impacts. And when we think about our region, particularly um, my, the Mon Valley, which I represent, uh, these are people who are already compromised by pollution. These are folks who, ha who have to live every day in the area that has among the worst air quality in the nation. It's important that as we're kind of moving forward and we're investing in industries and we're investing in our workers, that we're doing it, keeping in mind the safety of our community, balancing the needs of our workers, but also the needs of our community members, uh, the needs of the environment itself. And that's what we want to do. Uh, so we voted against that, A, because building out that petrochemical hub is, is dangerous. It is frankly dangerous. Uh, but B, not because we don't value workers. You know, um, I'm proud to have stood on picket lines with workers across the state uh, every single time that they call because I truly believe in, the, in unions for all. Uh, and I truly believe uh, in, in worker protection and workers' rights. But we also know that environmental justice is going to get us soon. Um, to, to kind of use the, the example of this, right now we know that President Trump is looking to open up the country back by Easter. That means that he would send our workers out into a global pandemic uh, with no protections, and he would leave them to fend for themselves. Um, that shows very kind of, it's, it's a very immediate kind of reaction of, we cannot continue to pit health and wealth. We cannot continue to say that we need jobs at the, uh, uh, and the, at the expense of the economy and vice versa. We have to come together to talk about how we can do both of those things. Uh, we have to bring all folks to the table uh, so that we are making a plan. Economies change um, and society has to be flexible as it does that. But it's important that we don't do what we did last time and we left our coal workers high and dry. Or we don't allow to what happened last time to my community where the steel industry did not collapse but left. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're mitigating that, but also being realistic about our needs and realistic about our future. Okay, I see one more hand raised here, and we'll make that the last question and then move on to the next race. So Christine Seppi. Uh, I really appreciated what you said about the situation showing the vulnerabilities of life that are already there for so many people. And uh, Ed Ganey also talked about the issue of all the small businesses. And I wonder what suggestions um, you have for the legislature that would be more help for the people who are, who are seriously vulnerable in this situation, yeah. who don't have jobs and don't have food and can't pay for their housing. Yeah. You know, the reality of, of this is that this is, a, this is an issue and a situation that's going to take the coordination of all levels of government, all levels of our community and our society. What we're seeing right now is, and just literally for, for a quick example, right now my high school is literally doing a, a crowdsourcing to get laptops and Chromebooks to the most vulnerable kids so that when our school year is ended, those kids can still learn remotely equitably. He's going to the community to do that because the state is not funding our education at the way at the level it should be. Uh, those are all things that we have to talk about. I think when we're thinking about our small businesses and those folks who are without a job, um, in one day or two days, their bills are going to be due. 
and we know that housing is unaffordable already. We know that families who have been laid off, our families who are already struggling before this are gonna be the ones who are hardest hit. Um, I was proud to have introduced, uh, to be introducing a bill that would hold evictions and uh, foreclosures. I mean, our Supreme Court moved on that. That's one way that we can help people. Uh, the next way that we can help people um, literally is a UBI. Uh, we've actually heard about this a lot uh, over the last year through our debates, our presidential debates. Uh, that's something that we are actually getting through our stimulus package is essentially a UBI. Uh, I think we recognize that it possibly, it probably should be a little bit higher. Uh, because people have not just a one-time issue, but this is probably going to last for months. And the impacts of it is going to last months and even years after that. Uh, so money, cash money going to the hands of people um, is our next thing. This is the next thing that we need to talk about is educational equity. Um, I think a lot of the things that we're seeing now, again, these are not issues that are just coming up. These are issues that have been compounding um, and that circumstance have kind of put into relief, but these already been issues. So funding our education system, um, ensuring that we have an equitable funding scheme for schools, uh, that's another thing that we need to be doing right now. Uh, immediately moving on paid family leave and paid sick time, uh, because we recognize that paid sick time doesn't help right now because our schools are out, so we need both. Uh, we, need, we can't say that workers shouldn't come to work when they're sick, uh, but then also not give them paid, paid leave. And we also can't shut our schools down and say that, that family members can't stay home uh, to care for their families. Uh, so that's the next thing that we need. Um, those are some of the issues that I can think of off top, but I love to, I think I have lists in various places where I've been talking about it on social media, but we definitely have a recommendation list. Healthcare is another one, healthcare for all, because people are getting their bills back uh, from their, their hospital stays with coronavirus and it's breaking their backs, it's going to bankrupt people. Uh, what we really need is the same bailout that the corporate, uh, that our corporations are getting actually should be invested instead into people uh, at the grassroots. Uh, and we need to see how trickle up works instead of trickle down. All right.